Hello and welcome to another episode of Research Radio, a podcast of the Economic and Political Weekly. I'm Johan and today we have with us Dr. Radhika Kumar who will be discussing her work on electoral politics in Jatland, the changing political landscape in Haryana. Dr. Radhika Kumar is with the Department of Political Science, Motilal Nehru College, University of Delhi. Welcome Dr. Kumar and thank you for joining us today. All right. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me today and it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Dr. Kumar, before we get into discussing electoral p- politics in Jatland, I should perhaps ask the question, who are the Jats? Because from reading your papers, I feel like understanding that is key to understanding why certain campaign strategies have worked in the region while others haven't. Uh Yes, in talking about uh, the Jats, the Jats as a caste community, uh, as we know, are spread across almost nine states in India. But in Haryana, uh, Jats have been a dominant caste, both numerically, as they constitute around 27% of the state's population. And they're also the agriculturally dominant caste because they own vast tracts of land. So uh, sticking to what Emin Srinivas calls a dominant caste, they also have access to most of the socioeconomic resources and also they are culturally dominant. Uh, mm-hmm. But historically, if we look at uh, how Jats have been, we, are, we read about them being warrior cultivators and semi-pastoralists. And in terms of uh, cultural practices, they have been known to be associated with what is called the Bhaichara system some kind of an egalitarian system which emphasizes Hindu-Muslim unity. It also brings into its fore the Gujars. But on the other hand, we also uh, read about the system being very hierarchical, especially when it comes to women and uh, and the lower castes. And that has also been typical to Haryana. Further, in terms of uh, identity in general, uh, the history of the Jats, particularly in Haryana, the identity has one which has been constantly evolving and uh, very often scholars tell us that it is based on some kind of othering that is uh, kind of establishing themselves as distinct from those above them in the caste hierarchy as well as those below them. So I would say that it's it's been a kind of a fluid uh, identity and uh, so therefore to fix it uh, you know, uh, is a little different. And in the more recent years, we have seen newer aspects of that as they have been agitating to be included within the category of those who deserve uh, some kind of affirmative action. So the success of the BJP in Haryana in 2014 was unprecedented. What do you attribute their success to, considering that historically, and as you just mentioned, the politics in Haryana has not been communally polarized? Uh, Yes, that's a very interesting question because, uh, uh, as you've already mentioned, uh, the BJP has not been very successful in Haryana and uh, communal polarization, even historically in Haryana, uh, you know, never really succeeded. And like I was just saying, this concept of egalitarianism or bhaichara has been typical uh, to at least the rural community in Haryana. But 2014 uh, was a bit different in certain ways. And uh, as we saw across the country, uh, the BJP led by Narendra Modi was able to uh, gain major electoral successes. So uh, one of the reasons why it also made a difference in Haryana was clearly how the BJP planned its election strategy, which I believe is very extensive and immersive. So political communication uh, has been something that the BJP has excelled at. And clearly that was not something that the Congress or other traditional parties in Haryana, like the INLD, uh, could match with. Also in Haryana, we see that uh, in the 2014 assembly elections, the Congress was facing massive anti-incumbency. There were lots of uh, cases of corruption uh, you know, some kind of uh, change of land use. There was forcible land acquisition, uh, uneven development because uh, it was said that the passion of the ruling uh, leaders, uh, Rohtak and other districts were the ones that saw maximum development. 
while the rest of Haryana, uh, you know, were really suffered under the rule of uh, Bupendra Singh Huda. So uh, uh, these were also some of the local factors uh, that worked against uh, uh, the Congress party. And uh, most importantly, I believe, you know, it was uh, the kind of persona uh, that Narendra Modi brought with him, the kind of performativity, the popularity uh, that he was able to put across to the voters uh, that really worked uh, for the BJP. And, um, you know, there's this example that I often cite uh, of a uh, of uh, a rally uh, that took place in Faridabad, where while uh, addressing the gathering uh, at the end of, uh, you know, the his speech, he said that, you know, I want you all to take back all the plastic cups and other things that you have used, you know, while uh, coming mm -hmm. here in the rally. And suddenly there was a scramble. Uh, amongst the audience to do that. So there was this sense of involvement, you know, connection that he was able to forge with the electorate, which I think uh, really enthused a lot of young people, uh, uh, especially in Haryana. And uh, uh, so, so that I think uh, worked for the party uh, in 2014. It was something uh, new, it was something different. Uh, and it was not based on uh, at least outwardly, it was not based on identity politics. There was a promise of development, uh, you know, a, a concept of self-reliance, uh, which, uh, as I also write about, seems to hark back to what Sir Choturam at one point was talking about uh, with respect to the Jats, you know, that uh, they are extremely industrious, hardworking, and, and that's the identity that they want to put forward. Uh, so uh, clearly we all know that elections are not, uh, you know, because of any one factor or variable, it's many factors put together. And so to my mind, these were some of the things that worked for the BJP in the 2014 assembly elections. Could you speak a bit more about this concept of leadership and also how this is embodied in the political dynasties in Haryana? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so this idea of leadership or what uh, in local parlance is called chaudhar uh, is something that is uh, pretty much a part of the vernacular imagination. And uh, uh, it takes on the idea that uh, if a particular electoral constituency, uh, you know, has the possibility of electing the next chief minister, uh, you know, they get extremely enthused. So uh, uh, Chaudhar has been something that political parties have leveraged uh, in a bid to mobilize voters from particular constituencies or a particular area, uh, you know, uh, so that uh, it's also a way to increase their popularity. But uh, we know that in Haryana, most of these candidates, especially those who have been chief ministers, have come from the Jat community. So in asserting a certain region or a constituency's chaudhar or leadership, this also becomes something about asserting a kind of pan-state caste dominance. So uh, this idea of a chaudhar, the way I talk about it in one of my papers, is basically to say that in 2014, in the assembly election, when the BJP did not announce a chief ministerial candidate, uh, it pretty much did so possibly out of a, you know, it was a practical decision because they had no, uh, uh, no such leader who, could, who was well recognized. But also it was a way, I would think, of, uh, you know, hinting at a break from tradition, uh, you know. So uh, by saying that, okay, we're not going to announce uh, uh, a CM face or a CM name from the dominant community but we're going to leave it open. And this kind of uh, fits in with the eventual choice that the BJP made in terms of uh, designating Manohar Lal Khattar as the chief minister, who is a non-Jat. So uh, from the perspective of the election, uh, this idea of uh, uh, you know electoral constituencies electing a particular chief ministerial candidate this concept plays out in a certain way in the dominant versus non-dominant uh, narrative. But uh, 
to answer your question uh, uh, specifically, which is about the idea of uh, political leadership in general in Haryana and the concept of Chaudhar, clearly it is an indication of the persistence of uh, political dynasties, uh, which has been typical to electoral politics. And uh, uh, anyone well versed with the politics in Haryana knows of the three lals, that is Devi Lal, Bansi Lal, and Bhajan Lal, who uh, do claim certain regional uh, constituencies as uh, the ones that they dominate. So, uh, in fact, we have a scholar, Adam Zakefield, who in a paper talks about how family connections, as well as previous experience, have favored a candidate's chances, you know, in the case in Haryana, in electoral competition. So out of uh, his study, he says that, yes, familial connections do make a difference. So, uh, for instance, uh, the Chatalas are known to come from Sirsa, that's the area they dominate, uh, the Hudas from Rotak. Uh, Rao Inderjeet Singh, another tall uh, leader in Haryana, comes from the Ahirwal region, which is the districts of Gurgaon, Rivadi, Mahindargarh. And uh, Bhajan Lal belongs to Hisar, Bansi Lal to Bhivani. So they have kind of established their Chaudhar or regional leadership uh, in different parts of the state, which also tells us that regional leadership in Haryana is quite important and uh, uh, which has been another reason possibly historically why the BJP could not really uh, do well uh, because of these uh, regional bastions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kumar, if the BJP was so successful with their strategy in 2014, why did they shift gears to try and push a nationalist rhetoric in 2019? And also why was it not as successful as expected? Yeah, no, I think that's a very important question uh, because it kind of makes us think about uh, comparative strategies and uh, reasons for success. So, uh, yes, it's true, as you pointed out, that uh, the BJP did uh, make a change in the way it uh, kind of uh, framed its electoral narrative in 2019. And this is possibly also because uh, that is also the, the way they uh, frame the narrative in the uh, uh, national level elections, in the Lok Sabha elections of 2019. So there was a focus on, uh, you know, uh, the surgical strikes and uh, uh, how India was kind of asserting itself much more than earlier uh, in the global arena. So that narrative I think kind of uh, uh, because it worked so well in the Lok Sabha elections and the BJP won all 10 parliamentary seats in Haryana, uh, they would expect that it would also win or uh, work well uh, in the assembly elections. So uh, while that remained uh, the main uh, theme of the party, it is interesting how uh, you know, Narendra Modi uh, leading the BJP campaign in Haryana tried to fit that nationalist appeal into uh, a regional context. So uh, again, I take this example of a rally that was held in Balabgarh, where he talked about how the removal of Article 370, uh, you know, was something that um, actually uh, would be a kind of, uh, uh, would, would benefit uh, the uh, uh, people in Haryana, for example, he said that the Dalits who went to work uh, in Jammu and Kashmir as uh, cleaners would no longer have to do so because now they would get government jobs. Also, he said that it is Haryana that had contributed most of the soldiers uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. And this move was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a, a sort of balm to the uh, to the widows and the children of these soldiers so uh, very clearly he was trying to uh, make that point about nationalism and yet fit it into uh, uh, the local level uh, uh, politics uh, state level politics so uh, and this in a sense also played out in the slogan that the party used Haryana Ek, Haryan B Ek. So they were trying to bring all the uh, uh, all the sections of society together. 
But uh, one must not forget this period between the 2014 and 2019 elections, which also saw massive mobilization by the Jat community demanding reservations, and that led to extreme violence in the state. Uh, there was looting, there was arson, many people died. Uh, many people were charged with uh, uh, with violence, and most of them came from the Jat community. So uh, we do see a kind of fracturing of the social fabric uh, in that period, and uh, particularly the Jats were uh, very unhappy with the way uh, the BJP-led government had handled the entire issue. So uh, while the uh, the party was hoping to kind of make use of what we also call as cross effects. That is uh, a very uh, a short time period between the national election and the state assembly where in the state assembly election, you could possibly make use of the, uh, you know, the popularity that the party had and the victory that it uh, had in the national level elections. One doesn't see that playing out. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, my analysis has been that uh, these three communities, not just the Jats, but also the Muslims, because of the uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, the communal angle and the Dalits, uh, who were also uh, uh, who have also seen increasing cases of violence, and some of the studies talk about how over a ten-year period there has been a seven-fold increase in violence against the Dalits in Haryana, were rather unhappy with the incumbent government. So in their own ways. Uh, uh, they seem to have uh, uh, moved away uh, from the BJP, and uh, which was, which in fact led to a reduction in the seats that the party won in the 2019 assembly elections. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kumar, in your paper on the Jats and reservations, you note that there was a time when they were seeking recognition as a Kshatriya caste and simultaneously demanding reservation by claiming the status of an agricultural caste. I find this very interesting because of its implications for caste identity and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, yes, uh, this is something that, uh, uh, that has been um, uh, something that has come to the fore more recently. But if you dig into the history, uh, particularly of the Jats in Haryana, uh, this concept or uh, this question of identity, rather, is something uh, that has been very fluid for them. And uh, uh, the way I look at it, official categories of recognition also uh, have uh, been contested in India. So uh, this contestation uh, is not new, particularly for the Jats, uh, because it is something that we also talk about uh, in the colonial period. So uh, uh, during that time too, there are references, there is literature which tells us that uh, uh, you know the Jats were trying to do two things simultaneously, which is like you just mentioned, they were trying to gain Kshatriya status. And that Kshatriya status was to be gained through uh, you know, local level association. So one of the ways that we know of this is that they you know, were very close uh, to the Arya Samajas and through the Shuddhi movement, uh, they wanted to claim higher caste status, uh, while on the other hand, to gain benefits from the colonial government, uh, they wanted some kind of recognition as uh, a backward, uh, backward caste. So uh, uh, while this demand has been uh, ongoing, uh, somehow uh, over uh, post and even in the post-independence period, this has not really materialized. So we know about various commissions which have been set up, for instance, the Gurnam Singh Commission uh, that was set up in Haryana in 1991, which for the first time uh, recognized uh, the Jats as a backward uh, uh, class and it extended 26% reservation. And there were many other castes which were included, but the Jats as well. So uh, while this was also notified, uh, subsequent governments uh, did not accept this and it is also interesting to note that in Haryana, uh, many of the governments led by JAR chief ministers have not been willing to extend uh, uh, a backward class status to the JADs and, uh, uh, and therefore those uh, um, 
the recommendations of various commissions have not been accepted. Um, in 2012, uh, Bhupender Singh Huda uh, did accept the recommendation of the Backward Class Commission and granted 10% reservation uh, and included the Jats under the special backward classes. But this again was uh, struck down by the courts because uh, in Haryana, there is already 27% reservation for the other backward classes. And uh, therefore, this kind of exceeded the 50% limit that has been set by the Supreme Court. So uh, uh, the idea of identity is, uh, you know, something that, uh, like I said, is uh, uh, something that is constantly being reworked uh, and redefined by the Jats. Uh, on the one hand, there is the idea of uh, being uh, a Kisan or a hardworking peasant, which is something that was framed by Sir Chotu Ram. And he also was uh, very critical of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other communities whom for him were servile and passive, whereas the Jats were the ones who were assertive. So uh, on the one hand, while they have been wanting to be distinct, uh, within the caste hierarchy, there is also this sense of moving up. And yet, uh, at some point, mostly I would think this resurgence of the demand relates to the post-liberalization period. This is a recognition of the fact that the, uh, the way the economy has changed and agriculture no longer is uh, dominating uh, you know, the economy and the returns are not what they were earlier. There has been a desire to move into uh, those sectors which they believe have come to be dominated by the forward caste. And if not that, then clearly some kind of a, a affirmative action policy which can uh, enable more and more of the youth uh, to take advantage of uh, government jobs. Uh, so, uh, so this identity continues to be uh, fraught with tensions, uh, which is something you did point out. And um, uh, though um, unfortunately or fortunately difficult to decide on that, but this demand continues to be outstanding. And Haryana, um, Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir are the three states where Jats still have not been included amongst the uh, category of the OBCs. I see. Uh -huh. Dr. Kumar, I'd like to go back to something that you were mentioning a little earlier, and that is the relationship between the Jats and the non-Jats. How has that relationship come to shape the electoral space in Haryana in recent years? Uh, yeah, this uh, relationship between the Jats and the non-Jats has been a tumultuous one. It has... Uh, constantly been changing. Uh, some of this, like I said, historically uh, uh, has been one where uh, the way the Jats have defined themselves, uh, something I mentioned earlier as well, is based on a process of othering. So uh, the Jats in general are known to exercise subcaste exogamy and caste endogamy. So it's pretty much a closed group. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, if we talk about, uh, uh, you know, as I was saying, the historical instance of Bhai Chara, so uh, uh, the Jat Party in that sense, if we can call it that, uh, uh, the National Unionist Party established by Sir Chotu Ram included people from all communities. So uh, there is also that idea of egalitarianism, which we find uh, has been typical to the community uh, historically. But... Uh, but like I said, this has been changing and uh, possibly this fracture is seen most recently uh, following the uh, JAT agitation for reservation. And at that time, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the arguments which were being made was that now in Haryana, it is 35 biradiris or communities versus one, which is the JATs. Otherwise, earlier, uh, they would pride themselves of on being uh, a state which has 36 biradris who are all together, that is 36 communities, caste groups, which are all together. So this fracture uh, is something that kind of uh, became deeper following the Jat agitation, also because it was said that at that time, uh, the arson and the looting uh, happened uh, in the non-Jat households. It was done by the Jats 
and it was particularly the non jats who were being targeted so it became uh, you know it, it it became a community based agitation also apart from the fact that it was a a, a movement to pressurize the government uh, to grant uh, reservations to the uh, to the jats so um, uh, so this kind of a, a fracture is, is something that uh you know uh, there is more and more talk about it and in the electoral arena uh, when we look at the 2019 election uh, it becomes clear that uh, you know one of the reasons why the bjp was uh, more successful was that it was able to put forward this jat versus non jat narrative one instance i have already cited in terms of uh, the chief ministerial choice also they were talking about how in most of the administrative positions uh, particularly uh, you know the the lower administrative positions these were dominated by the jats the police departments in haryana in various districts were jo- dominated by the jats so in their uh, term in power uh, they in fact tried to uh, uh, restore this balance i mean the claims were that that the recruitment would now be done on a fair basis and people from any one community or caste would not uh, you know be favored in appointments mm-hmm. so uh, uh, a lot of this uh, you know uh, this fracture uh, is something that is typical of the way uh, the economy of the state has functioned uh, so from a traditional caste dominance in the landed arena you now find that as the as the country as a whole moves towards newer uh, occupations and newer services and agriculture loses you know its uh, uh, viability uh, there is the desire amongst these traditional landed castes to uh, find a foothold in these newer occupations and therefore uh, that tension also shows in the rural arena so uh, plus also the way political parties mobilize communities so this polarization is also something that led to uh, a kind of a fracture uh, though in the 2019 election as i was saying if you look at the electoral trends clearly uh, many amongst the dalits the muslims and the jats did not vote uh, for the bjp but this again does not tell us uh, that whether it has led to some kind of uh, pan state consolidation clearly it has not because it was not a co- concerted action Mm-hmm. also the uh, you know the relation between the jats and the dalits in haryana <clears throat> has also always been a very difficult one and we have many instances of violence against the dalits uh, mm-hmm. in haryana and uh, uh, so therefore from that perspective too um, uh, there are fractures which are uh, clearly visible uh, so um, uh, intercaste uh, uh, relations Uh, are not something which are very smooth and uh, i don't see them smoothing out in the uh, in the near future either that brings me to my final question dr kumar and that is where do you see this what you call an identitarian turn headed with regard to the politics of haryana right so um i see this uh, uh the idea of an identitarian turn is to suggest that identity uh particularly caste identity i would think is something that continues to play an important role uh, in electoral politics so uh, a lot of literature on electoral politics uh, has of late been talking about uh, you know the narrative of development and how that narrative tends to trump other kinds of uh identity based narratives uh also uh, welfareist narr- narratives uh you know the, those that talk about populism uh, distribution of goods so clearly there are various ways in which we understand how parties mobilize uh, voters what works uh, best with voters what has changed over the years and uh, uh, haryana is uh, not an outlier in that sense that in haryana too if uh, one were to think of the 2014 assembly election like i was saying clearly there is a narrative which is very different that the bjp was putting forward uh, of self reliance 
you know, uh, at some level of kind of owning uh, the development uh, uh, project and not kind of uh, thinking that the government will do it for you. That sense of, uh, you know, uh, constituting it yourself. Uh, but clearly, uh, it that is not the only aspect in which mobilization took place. And uh, polarization in terms of dominant versus non-dominant has also played a role in, uh, uh, in pulling in voters uh, to vote for a particular party. So uh, to my mind, uh, if one mobilizes voters on that basis and those identities remain important, then clearly identity politics cannot be dismissed as an important factor in determining electoral outcomes. Uh, and this is not just for Haryana, uh, even other states, uh, you find increasing assertion of forward caste, for instance, in UP, there has been talk of forward caste pushing back uh, you know, the other caste, whereas for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. we talked about uh, how, you know, the uh, the lower caste, the marginalized caste, they were the ones who were uh, kind of uh, coming together mm -hmm. and uh, uh, electing leaders belonging to specific regional or community-based parties. So uh, my argument is this, that identity politics uh, is important. And if we look at the 2019 assembly election results, decode it along those lines where, where I have kind of thought of uh, thinking of the way reserved constituencies have voted as a proxy for the way the Dalit vote has gone. Clearly, that does play an important role in uh, electoral outcomes. So one can't be entirely dismissive of it. Uh, but uh, one has to take that into consideration while decoding any kind of uh, electoral result. I see. Uh, Dr. Kumar, your, your response actually reminded me of something else that you mentioned in one of your papers, and that is that the Jat identity, uh, they, were, they were able to consolidate it better than, for example, the Dalit uh, identity because there was you know, some amount of factionalism even within the the Dalit community which fractured the vote. So if you could elaborate on that a little bit, that would be interesting. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, one of the questions which uh, has bothered me for a while is that in the case of Haryana, we do know that 20% of the population is a Dalit population. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, none of the uh, so-called Dalit parties uh, in India have ever been successful in mobilizing the Dalits in Haryana. So uh, there have been many scholars who have written about this and have tried to uh, answer this question. And some of their uh, findings have been that uh, Dalits themselves are a highly divided community. Uh, so uh, very broadly, if we were to think of some of the subcasts, for example, the Chamars uh, versus the Bhangis, this has been uh, a kind of a classic rivalry uh, that continues to plague uh, the Dalit community. And uh, there is a village near my place, which I often visit, uh, uh, and I often talk to many of the respondents. And uh, uh, it is very evident that this kind of a rivalry has prevented them from coming together. And very often the dominant castes within the village have sided with one faction or the other. So they have benefited from keeping them divided, you know, and at the time of elections, even a panchayat level election, they have propped up one section or the other. So, uh, so they have benefited from, from this rivalry. And, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, to my mind, this may have been one of the reasons why we don't see consolidation of the Dalit vote in Haryana, uh, you know, uh, with respect to any one political party or even any leader, uh, you know, specific mm -hmm. leader. Uh, in fact, while uh, uh, talking to some of the local respondents, I was asking them about their caste. And I, uh, instead of waiting for that person's answer, I blurted out, okay, so you're from the Dalit community. And he kind of corrected me. And he said that, mm -hmm. no, Dalit is a political term. I'm not a Dalit, I'm a Chamar. 
so he said i only use mm-hmm. dalit or political parties use the term dalit when they come for my vote i do not use it so very clearly telling me that you know he does not identify in that manner the way i thought of him you know so so there is mm-hmm. clearly some kind of a disconnect in the way we think of identities and the way uh, we we talk about them so so that's one also um, uh, in the case of haryana uh, the uh, the dalits have not uh, overtly challenged the jats in terms of land ownership and land ownership has been one of the flash points of uh, 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 violence uh, between the jats and dalits in haryana because many of the common lands too that the panchayat kind of leases out have uh, which were are meant to be leased out to the dalits have been taken over by the jats but in haryana what we find is that instead of uh, confronting the dalits uh, sorry the jats the dalits have instead made use of the uh, reservation policies in education and in government employment to kind of better their status and they have moved up in in terms of their uh, uh, economic status they are doing much better which is also considered to be a flash point because jats often see this as uh, you know a kind of downward mobility if we can use that word uh, that the, because the dalits are moving up their own status has kind of gone down so uh, uh, so that remains a uh, a cause of concern for the dominant caste uh but uh, these these are some of the uh, you know uh, uh, arguments uh, which are made uh, with regard to why dalits in haryana have not been as uh, uh, you know assertive or vocal uh, about uh, uh, about their demands or about uh, you know how they are treated or instances of violence which i said are many in haryana but one doesn't see that kind of a movement or political mobilization thank you so much dr kumar i think those are all my questions for today it was really a pleasure talking to you yeah. today same here thank you so much my first time and i really enjoyed it so so thank you so much thank you yaan thank you so much dr radhika i also want to thank all our listeners for joining us you can find the articles discussed in today's episode in the show notes and to experience all that EPW has to offer head over to epw.in today and subscribe this is johan singh bye bye and see you next time on research radio <laughs> <laughs>